if you like betting on golf but everyone that you back misses the cut get some experts involved with all the stats and the tips and so much more cause it's the golf betting system the golf betting system is the golf betting system podcast greetings and welcome to the golf betting system podcast it's episode 312 this is our 2024 us open tips podcast the returning barry o'hanrahan and paul williams join me steve bamford to discuss our selections for this week's third major championship good morning gents Morning, guys. Morning, guys. For our world-famous golf betting system website, where we have in-depth betting previews for the US Open. So, we've got an overall preview. We have Paul's long shots piece. He's also going to put around together some first-round leader tips. We've got recent major finish stats. I'm going to run through some of those later on. Well worth a look. Form stats... We've also got, of course, old and new predictor models for the US Open. All of that content, completely free of charge. There is no paywall at Bolt Golf Betting System. All of us are available on X. Barry is at A Good Talk Golf. Paul is at Golf Betting. I am at Bamford Golf. Subscribe to the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where this podcast is available, along with my weekly golf betting show. That's already out there in the ether on YouTube. Now, you guys as listeners power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts as ever. For those of you who leave a review, I will read them out at the start of a future show. Leave your name and where you are in the review. We are desperate for reviews, so please take some time, even 30 seconds. Just give us five words. It really doesn't matter, but uh, give us a five-star review if you can spare the time. Right, love the pod title. Hi all. Really enjoy the pod each week. Great chemistry between the three of you. And always read the preview. Steve with the PGA, Paul with the DP World Tour. Any chance Barry previews live? Question mark. Had strong view, had strong views that Scotty would win the Masters, so it was a good week. I've had a nice bet on Scotty for the US Open at eleven to two, which is now gone. After he won at Augusta, Keimer won by half the track in 2014 with a solid long game. And a good week on the greens, but an insane week around the green. If that doesn't shout Scotty, I'm not sure what does. Hoping for another good week there. Keep up the good work. And that is from Will Murray. And Will is in the UK. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Will. Nice I'm, Will. Yeah, I'm not sure about Barry right in the previews. Perhaps Will should after that um, lowdown on Scotty there. Mm. Very comprehensive. Very good. Very good indeed. Mm. Let's quickly run through next uh, last week. Oh, by the way, those five star reviews. Can we please have some? Because I am literally now dry. So this section next week could be quite embarrassing. Of total silence for thirty seconds. Okay, let's quickly run through last week. Most people are probably trying to forget it. Uh, Paul Sebastian Soderberg. Give me thirty seconds. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a pretty boring Sunday um, with uh, Soderberg. What was he eight clear going into the final just the round eight. and just the eight? Yeah, uh, and Scotty looking unstoppable over in the states. So uh, yeah, I was ready just to uh, to write the Sunday off. Um, I'd already written it off from a golf betting perspective anyway because it was a shocker. But other than that, um, yeah, it didn't look like much was going to happen. But no, absolute shades of. Uh, Shades of Martin Keimer in Abu Dhabi, wasn't it? With the, the way that he just continued to hemorrhage shots uh, and then finally got to that 18th hole where well, he'd been looking shaky all day, but the shakiness just completely took over. And yeah, poor bunker, poor bunker shot, poor putt, poor second putt. That and, first uh, putt reminded me of Lee Westwood in his prime. It's just. It, <laughs> you, you know, when Lee it. used to have those knee knockers, and he'd yeah. always leave it sort of five, six feet sh- short. There's nothing worse for a golf punter than a, than a, a guy that literally cannot get in anywhere near the hole when the uh, when the when the tension's on. Well, you know, you, you what was that part? That him? second part then? What what distance do you reckon yeah, you missed that? It wasn't. From? It was three foot. It wasn't much more than that. 
But even so, you know, you, you're looking at it and the way that he's played and the, the way that the day is gone and, you, you know, seriously feared for him at that point and quite rightly so. It, You know, his, his head had gone. Um, had he made birdie on the 17th uh, um, with that, uh, you know, a decent approach shot there. So, you know, had his chance to, to put it to bed effectively. But, yeah, he, he just... Uh, just lost it on that final final hole, and yeah, Lynn Grant, a second win at that tournament for Lynn Grant, yeah. and uh, you know, grateful recipient. She's almost an embarrassed recipient at the end there because didn't expect for that to happen, did she? You know, well, she I think she was twelve behind going into the final round. And um, someone said on social media that she was four hundred to one. I didn't even look that far down the list, so I can't tell well, you, you that, yeah. the exact number. But um, you tipped her up yeah. last year. I did, yeah, yeah, and she she won the year before and the one the year after. So that's right. It's the golf betting system podcast. Yeah, it's the way things go, isn't it? But yes, but uh, yeah, interesting over in the states as well. Unlucky on Colin Morikawa for you, Steve. That <coughs> must be your eight hundredth uh, second place finish for the season. Tenth, tenth, tenth of twenty twenty four. One winner, ten runner ups. I had Victor Hovland as well. He was right up in the mix, and Scotty started wobbling on Saturday. I thought, oh, Hovland's in luck here. Mm. He then, across his last 28 holes, produced one double, 10 bogeys, and three birdies. So um, that kind of... Because I had Victor very much in mind for the US Open this week. Yep. But uh, when that started to firm up at, uh, at Jack's place, wow. As soon as he was missing greens... Jeez. One double, ten bogeys. I think he had a, a stretch of four bogeys on the trot. Mm. Doesn't happen. Uh, that didn't fill me with enthusiasm for Pinehurst. I had Tony. Tony was literally slashing it around the golf course, but was doing his sev- a good sevy act around the greens. He was chipping everything in. Uh, actually making some putts, which is worthy of note. Tony Fee now followers. Actually mm. had a good week with the putter, which I think is the first time in 2024. We have said 3M Open, Rocket Mortgage, these these smaller yeah. fields. I think he's going to beat one of these weak fields up. Um, I, I say these things to try and remind myself to actually do put that tip in when I get to those weeks, by the way. Yeah, make that note, Barry. Make Can you get, grab a post-it note, Barry? I mean, I'm surrounded by them here. Um, when Steve fact, doesn't yeah. put up, when, when he doesn't put up Tony Finn out at the 3M or... At 16 Rocket. to 1. Yeah, it's bl- blast away. Okay, yeah. <laughs> At the Rocket Mortgage Classic. Mm. Everyone will be going, oh, I want back Tony Fina at 16 or <laughs> yeah. Um So he he was going to get me a full each way at 45 to 1. Then he bogeyed two of the last three. But Colin, of course, he, he went head to head with Scotty, best player in the world by a mile. And actually, you can't say anything against Colin. I think I thought he played really well across the whole tournament. Yep. He's reminding me, Colin is reminding me of Xander at Quail when Rory won the week before the PGA. Mm. Yeah, I get that. You know, you, you look at him on the odds market and you think, hitting the ball well, t- first for greens in re- uh, first for driving actually on the whole PGA Tour, Striking his irons again with that beautiful fade that he, he gets used to. I mean, he can't he can't move the ball both ways, but you know, like he said, I think he got to the point where he tried to become a a fader and a, a player that can move the ball both ways, and then lost the lot. Yeah. He's now said, "I'm just concentrating on what actually got me to this point, which is just playing fade all the time." Um, and as we've seen with Dustin Johnson and players, that can <laughs> that can bring you a very good living. Um, but yes, I, I think I think Colin is this week's Xander that we saw at the PGO. Playing some very nice golf. Mm, we'll see. Very nice golf indeed. I have said that I'm going to do this more regularly. T to green numbers from last week's memorial. Just for those that like to make a note of these things. Scheffler at one. 3.2 strokes per round, T to green. Adam Hadwin too. He played really well, didn't he? Adam Hadwin is, is is he, is he trying to get in the um, the Olympics? There's is it something lot, like that that there's another one of these deadlines coming? There, up? 
there are a lot of players who are trying to. Yeah, it's, it's quite complicated the Olympics, depending on the the country and the world ranking positions. But um, yeah, there's a lot of players with that on their mind, certainly. Mm. He was at two point seven. Then Colin, Sahith Tagala at four, Corey Connors five, Christian Bezaden who who all I could see on uh, Sunday was him just chipping everything in. Mm. The old magic beans from Christian. Hideki Matsuama, I reckon some of you guys are going to be putting some of these players up this week. Matsuama at seven and Sep, not Seb, Sep Stracker at eight. Playing some great golf, Sep. Really, really is. Right, should we crack on with the US Open? Let's do it. Paul and I did a research podcast. Clearly, that uh, that is podcast number 311. We go into the intricacies of Pinehurst number two, winning trends, what you like to see of players coming into the event. Now, I have seen, of course, we're now recording this on Tuesday, I've seen some footage from the course, I'm seeing feedback from the course. Um, There was some kind of feedback, and I saw some videos with the course superintendent, saying that he's tried to create the green surrounds here, the runoff areas, to quite a a state where you're not automatically pulling putter. Mm -hmm. So they've tried to soften the green surrounds, yeah, with water. Mm -hmm. And they're also making them quite fluffy. What this is trying to do is stop pros from literally automatically seeing their approach shot running off the green, and if it isn't running into a bunker or sandy area, getting the putter straight out of the bag. And from what I saw yesterday, there was a great piece that Johnson Wagner always does from these major courses, where he was around one of the greens, and he's he's basically showing how crazy these greens are, what the runoff areas are like. And it's funny because he's got the chipping yips. And he's, you know, he's trying to chip with wedges and he's duffing it. He's trying to chip with five irons and making a hash of it. He's even getting out, th- you know, five woods and trying that technique. And then he gets the putter out and li- literally knocks it to two feet. Yeah. And or what you could see on this coverage was literally around these greens, the amount of pitch marks where all of these pros are chipping was insane. And he mentioned that a lot of the high traffic areas are covered in chicken wire at the moment because they're trying to protect the surrounds of these greens. Because from what I'm seeing, this this golf course boils down to two things. It's pretty simple this week. Weather doesn't look like it's going to be a factor, which is great. If you can find players that are absolutely fantastic in serious heat, yeah, this isn't a bad week because we're looking at temperatures of 32 to 33 degrees Celsius, up to 92 degrees Fahrenheit. So, <clears throat> North Carolina, South Carolina at this time of year is hot. Okay, so very hot conditions, humidity, not a lot of wind. There's no threat of rains whatsoever. So this is great, Baron. The USGA have got complete control of this golf course. The only moisture that is going on it is the morning dew and what they decide to put on it. That's That, to me, is total clarity. So what we see from that golf course is purely what the USGA have decided to do on the setup. Yeah. Do you see those... Now, um, you, see on, the comments from, you see the comments from Wyndham Clark yesterday? Yeah, about the, that was literally uh, what I was going to say. Yeah. Cool. No, it's, uh, well, uh, you know, steal your thunder, but yeah, he was just saying that the... The greens are already borderline um, at this stage, which, um, well, from a spectacle and a US Open that we want to see, that's exactly where we want it, isn't it? It is. That's exactly where Barry wants it. That's brilliant, because now they can drag it back a little bit for Thursday and slowly just release it over the weekend. Yeah. Mm. This is, I think Barry's hit on that. You, You... You can't soften a golf course the week before leading up to tournament week and then try and speed it up. So clearly, they've, they, they're they kind of going for the Augusta route. Yeah. We've said this year after year at Augusta. They reckon that the Greens on Saturday and Sunday at Augusta prior 
to the Masters week are when they're at their firmest and fastest. And yeah. a lot of the ladies have had to play on that, on that ladies tournament beforehand. Mm. Then they just soften them off and then they start bringing them in towards the end of the week again. Yeah. There's only so much you can do with these golf courses before they go completely haywire. Mm, I mean, yeah. we're, we're dealing with very small tolerance percentages. Mm. Where, the where it's either, is, yeah, it's either so in narrow. hand or it's out of hand. Yeah. So that was encouraging and for me. And they'll always have to look back to, um, what was it, Shinnecock? Got bananas. Yeah. 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 And they always have that in mind. And it, it can be the it could be the difference in a slight change of wind direction or you know, for an hour or two, and that can be the thing that tips it over the edge and makes it supremely challenging and entertaining for us to watch or unplayable. So it's it's not a balancing act, I'm sure, is easy in in, in any one way. Um but it sounds like we have Great potential for a visual treat, so bring it on. Mm. Yeah, thank you, thank you, weather gods. Yeah, it was, it, well, it's, it's nice for a, a major not to be plagued with uh, with loads yeah. of rain. Most yeah. of the rain was in May. They had yeah. 139 mils, which is more than they expect. They've had 19 mils in June. That I think the last of that was Friday, maybe Saturday. But it, this this looks as dry. It's dry. It's so great. So the USGA are in control. I, I said this. I think this boils down to two things. I found it, br- you know, brilliant that when you actually look at the aerial view of many of these holes, and I am quoting on my betting preview that these holes can be um, thirty-five to forty-five yards wide off the tee. Now that's wide. That is very wide. Now compared to Colo- uh, compared to Muirfield Village last week. Jack's put in 300 yards uh, carry, 28-yard wide fairways. So, um, yeah. But what you do see here, you do see this on a lot of the holes. Again, they've got pinch points. And they've got pinch points at very good spots, whereby they're tempting Rory to literally whack driver. But he's got to clear a pinch point on the fairway that's 22 yards wide, maybe. And what Mm. the USGA have done with the course superintendent here is they have just packed those sandy areas with wire grass either side of those pinch points there is no and i mean no it's either fairway or sand there's no first cut there's no rough there's nothing you're either on the fairway or you're in these um Native natural sand areas, yeah, but they are areas. packed with all manner of <laughs> weird vegetation. Yeah, hit and miss in there. Now, Web Could I Simpson, add one more weather comments just before we ch- chop off it. Go on. That, that it's really appealing. We're gonna have it right now. It looks like we're gonna have an easterly wind on Thursday, a westerly wind on Friday. A northeaster on Saturday and a southeaster on Sunday. So <laughs> even better. Co- it's it's gonna be. It's just like, mm. it's like a Christmas uh, gift. But anyway, let's see. I just it's exciting to be. We'll be get to see the course play in very different ways, which is really cool as well. Mm. Encouraging. Big challenge. You got to play. You yeah, got big big challenge this week. So. Webb Simpson said in his interview yesterday on the USGA app, US Open app, he said, bearing in mind, he used to come down, he's played this a hell of a lot. His dad built a house on the property, apparently. Uh, They'd come up from Raleigh, and he'd be here most weekends as as a kid growing up. So he knows this course incredibly well, right? He said, the way I look at it, he was firstly very pleased to get through the qualifier. So fair play for to uh, to Webb to get through. He said that what you've got to do, you've got to say that even though these fairways are super super wide, at least his number that he quoted, I am thinking that I am going to miss the fairway a minimum of eighteen times. I am going to be in one these sandy areas, and at that point, it is pure luck. Mm. There's no more about it. You either you either get stitched up effectively, or you've got a nice position on some crusty sand, and I can then enha- enhance the ball, you know, towards that green complex. 
So we know for a fact that golfers hate this kind of stuff where you've got this... This is where I'm getting to. So anyway, that's point number one. I genuinely think that straight long drivers have a great advantage this week. Now, John Jeffries also mentioned this. That's the core superintendent. He said they focus so much of their attention around the greens. Now, you're going to hear, listeners, so many descriptions about these greens. I, I will describe them as unique. Um, I've heard them as upturned saucers, upturned cereal bowls. Come, you can come up with whatever you want to. But effectively, this was the number that grabbed me. And this came from John Jeffrey's lips in an interview I heard. These greens are quoted, he quoted them at 6,800 square feet. Chunky. Yep. He said that the on those on those greens, on average... The only area he can put flags on, pins on, are 2,000 to 3,000 square feet of each green, which is basically telling you that there's 2,000 to 3,000 square feet of each green where you can get an approach shot to stick. Yep. That's crazy. So less than half of each green complex have areas that you can hit approach shots to which will stay on the green. Yep. Yeah, the rest of it's too severe, and they can't, they can't put a pin on it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, if your approach is just off, you just aren't staying on that green. And, and, and he said, where... sorry, Paul, he no, said, just let, I'll finish this. Creating player indecision is the absolute thing that they've worked on the most around the greens as to whether chip on mm. down grain, tightly mown, textured lies, or putt on grass that will be just high enough, and I was saying this earlier, kind of flaky grass and moist enough in terms of the soil, to cause variability of result with the putter, that's the key for them. They've worked on these green surrounds to make them so player doesn't automatically grab putter out of the bag. Mm. Actually, you, can actually, you can actually hear the evil laughter when they came up with this. <laughs> well, Peter Costas, who was hosting this, said that. He said, I, I, I barely know you said, but I can tell you were a vindictive man. <laughs> uh, they've they've kind of proofed it. They're trying that's good. to, that's good, yes. Though. But I saw—I mean, I like I said yesterday. I saw Johnson Wagner putting it on the green. And he made, you know, he, he made it look relatively easy mm. on one green in one particular mm. position. Yeah, I yeah. grant you. If we watched the, everybody do putter all week long, it would be boring. So yeah, exactly I'm, right. I'm on board with this idea. <laughs> so the best way to defend that the, this course has two defense mechanisms. It's this wire gl- grass. And it is these ridiculously difficult greens. And that is why they need to get them to a stimp that at least on Saturday morning has got plenty of release in it. Because I genuinely think that they could make this, I mean, they could make it what they want. The USGA, Mike Davis has sailed, he's well over the horizon now. I I I would like to see personally a US Open where sort of five six open five or six under wins. Whether that happens, I don't know. Yeah, but I, it just I I hate it when I'm seeing Ricky Fowler like last year at LACC shooting sixty two on a Thursday morning. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's yeah, that's not a US Open. There should be Sorry. a handful of people under par. It's all going to be, boys, about the spin, the stimp in these greens. Now, in this interview again, he did quote, did John Jeffries, they are targeting, this was from his own lips, they are targeting just on 14 stimp for the Sunday. <laughs> that is the target. And he, he looked at the sky and he said, God willing. Mm. <sighs> So I think they're being quoted at 11 and a half to 12 already. Also, you talk, take Wyndham Clark. I think players say stuff just to put pressure on the organisers. I think there's a lot of that kidology goes on. Yeah, that's, that's funny to think that they'll pay too much attention. They'll listen, but like, you're not going to influence yeah. them. They have their plan. Could you, could you see the North Carolina uh, Fire Brigade turning up on Wednesday uh, evening about 8pm? Go and get on the course, lads. But that bouncing. that will ruin it. That will ruin it completely. Yeah, I hope not. Yeah, it, they ha- it has to be 
a little bit soft and receptive on Thursday if they want to let it progress throughout the week. So we could see, you could see a a decent score on Thursday for first round leader. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if you see the score get to, I don't know, maybe someone shoots a 63 and then we see that score just stick. No one's mm. going forward from there. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, that, that, I think that'd be fine. I've got no issues with that. It's okay. I, you know, this idea that, <clears throat> I don't know, I just don't, I don't, unless Scotty Scheffler literally plays unearthly well like he can and he's sitting there at 10 under and like the next person's at 3 under. I mean, there's a chance of that, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Yeah. There is a chance of that. Please, <laughs> please, don't, please right. don't let that happen. <laughs> Excuse me, I've got, I don't know what it is. My my uh, my wife has been diagnosed with the 100-day cough. And clearly I have it, so... Uh, the next sort of 13 to 14 podcasts are going to be interesting. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. Anything you guys want to say about the course before we move forward? I think, I think we've covered most of the basics there. It's, uh, it sounds like it's going to set up to be a challenge in US Open, which is exactly what I want to see. Okay, right. We've had three previous winners here. Payne Stewart, God, God bless his soul. Michael Campbell. And Martin Keimer. Now, just out of interest, I had a quick look through Wikipedia, as you do. Payne Stewart had won at Pebble Beach Pro-Am. He'd also won at Harbour Town. You know, I'm just looking. He'd also won at Harbour Town twice, by the way. 89 and 90. Mm. Carolina Golf Course, as we know. Pebble Beach is interesting. I do think there's a linksy feel to this golf course. I don't know what you think, Barry. Just the fact it's sand-based. I know it's landlocked, nowhere near the coast. But just the look at the place, the way it should mm. play firm, the way the sand fires up when they're hitting shots off the fairway. There's some, And the fact that you can also... <clears throat> it doesn't have to be a, te- a, a test in the air. You can actually run shots up onto the green. So there is a links mm. element to it. Yeah. Uh, Michael Campbell... He'd finished third at the 95 Open Championship, which they played at St. Andrews. By the way, Payne Stewart was a runner-up at St. Andrews uh, at an Open. He'd also finished 12th at the at the OO US Open, the one that Tiger won at Pebble Beach. He'd also finished 11th at Sawgrass. So this, this, and Martin Keimer, of course, we knew that he'd won Sawgrass before winning this. He'd also finished 10th in the US Open at Pebble Beach. So... I don't know why, I can't tell you that, but there's a couple, you know, Pebble Beach doesn't seem a bad angle, Sawgrass, good angle, um, I think Harbour Town's a decent angle, as we know, I know I know that course is, diff- is different to this, but again, Carolina Golf Course, lots of dog legs, I know this is Carolina Golf on, on, on steroids, but if you're looking for some angles, maybe some of those courses, right, let's look at the betting market. Scotty Scheffler, there's a there's a sniff of 130 out there, but generally three to one. Um, I'm seeing as short as five to two. Being backed, by the way. Yeah. Rory McIlroy next up, twelve to one. In a in a place, eleven to one general. Xander is a fourteen to one chance, although. In lots of spots, I'm seeing him now at nines. In in reality, I think Xander's becoming second favourite. Mm. Then Colin Morikawa at 16s. We've got quite a few at 20s. Bryson, Victor, Ludwig Oberg at 22. And then we're out to the likes of Brooks Kepka. And then there's a gap to John Rahm. 28 to 1. Pretty generally available. Same price that you would get with Tommy Fleetwood. Well, I'm going to ask you guys, let's mix this up. I want, I'm going to ask Paul first, then I'll come to you, Barry. Name me a player in the top 20 in the betting who you wouldn't back with my money. 
Oh, what a I could have said fade, but I'm not going to use that terminology. Wouldn't back with your money. Well, I'll start. I'll start with an easy one, Paul Cantley. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think we've um, we've we've talked a lot about Cantley, and the thing with Cantley is you may get an each way place out of him. Um, and if you're talking fifty to one in places, which I'm seeing, yeah. um, you know. Him backdooring a, an each way place wouldn't surprise me, um, but no, I no, no. won't be back at him. But um, yeah, I, that, that's not quite the same as with Steve's money. I, the, the one that I yeah. can absolutely go nowhere near is Justin Thomas. Now that is likely to come back and bite me on the backside, but oh. I've been sniffy about Thomas all year, and nothing that I've seen, particularly with a putter. Um, makes me want to change that view right now. There are improvements, and I can see that the reason he's been backed to some to some degree this week is because there have been improvements. But I'm st- seeing strokes gain negative for the last three weeks or three outings with the putter, and I really I just I can't see on a course that's going to get up to 14 stimp on Sunday a player that is struggling with that flat stick finding a way to actually perform and potentially win the tournament. I, it just doesn't compute for me. So That's a bold the, one. Yeah, I, I know. And, I've, you know, he's, he's been he's tipped. Good. And, yeah, it's and, and he's, you know, he's, he's a major champion. Um, one of Steve's favourites in the past. But, uh, well, yeah. I put him up last week. Yeah. Shot one under in the first round. You think, oh, it's not bad. He's in, in a decent spot. And then he just... Round two, strokes going off the tee, minus 1.392. On approach, minus half a stroke. Around the greens, minus 1.1. Strokes going putting, of course, minus 0.8. Strokes going total for the round, minus four. Mm. You just think, wow, he, he just ejects, doesn't he? Yeah. I still think that you put Justin Thomas, when he has to hit driver a lot, and he has to hit it sort of, he just, he's got... He, he's just got bad, bad drives in him. I really think that. That mm. particular round last week, he hit eight of 18 greens. So, yeah, I can see yeah. where you're coming from with Justin Thomas. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just too much of a stretch for me to go, go near him. What about you, Barry? Mm. John, John Ram has a task ahead of him this week. Like This is the worst he started a season of majors in his career. Hasn't won on live yet when you think probably should have picked one up at this stage. So he, they'll feel like a little extra pressure on his back this week. And there's apparently a bit of a, um, an injury he's dealing with as well. So it yeah. feels a bit cheap to pick on him, but you kind of have to feel like you put him onto that list. Um, after that, I think, I think Bryson will go okay because he's playing very well. I don't think he'll win, so that would be my that would be one of the braver ones in terms of where they are in the odds mm. to say that Bryson won't win. And I'm also going to say Xander. I'm going to add a few in here that I just don't think will win, but that doesn't mean they won't go well or give you an each way place, uh, each way return. Xander's just yeah. playing great golf, so I expect him to be in that top eight. Yeah, Xander's a funny one, isn't he? Because how does he respond to the PGA Championship win? Um, Mm -hmm. If he comes out and wins the US Open, then... Wow. Yeah, exactly, wow. Um, It takes a lot of players, a lot of time in general, to find a way to up their game again, to to reach that same level and go and win another major Mm -hmm. championship. Some players Mm -hmm. never never do, Um, but... um, you know that that may be the mark of the man should he come back and uh, and seriously contend this week. Um, but yeah, I, like you, I you know if I was back in players right at the very top there, then I'd, I'd struggle, I think, to get to Xander at, at nines or tens. <clears throat> Let, let's talk about the big one then. Would you back Rory with Steve's money? Cause that's that's the one we need to talk about. Hmm, it's a tough one, isn't it? It's a tough one. I, you know, I was on him last week and there, there wasn't much there. Um, but then... Is that a good thing? Yeah. You know, he's, he's gone the other way in these pre-major 
events, won the tournament and then not converted the major. And, mm. you know, I don't know. Is it Was, was it a conscious kind of, um, you know, preparation week rather than a, an all-out attack week, even though it was signature level and uh, all of the bells and whistles that come with that? Mm. You know, dif- difficult to tell. Um, I've not backed him. Um, plenty will, and I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I could put anyone off if they wanted to go down that route because he has a chance. But I'm very tempted. I just just to start, if I max out on the predictor model, the the firm conditions, uh, like yeah. you guys were saying on the on the uh, pre pod, yeah. he comes out number two, and he does play, and he has been better throughout his career getting better at playing difficult golf courses Um, whereas in his early years he used to just murder the easy ones but now he's Mm. become better and better at handling the difficult tests so you now have two very big factors this week that he has um, shown more than enough good homework in to to make me go uh." and the fact that he wasn't in contention last week is a plus for me he's not Mm. burned any massive mental energy He's not had to deal with too much of. I mean, like um, Muirfield Village is a, it's a, it's a, a test, you know, and that can kind of wear you down. You saw what it did to a few players; just absolutely yeah. spat them out, mm. um, and it can just uh, slap you around the place. And he didn't get any of that last week, so that, those are all good things. Uh, Steve, I would back Rory with your money. Mm. Another second but place, I, then. But but I'm mass- <laughs> yeah exactly I am hugely biased <laughs> so who'd who'd be yours Steve if you were backing him with mine great question I think Cam Smith yeah it doesn't I did a live chat yesterday on the um, Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel had over fifty guys on there for the premiere of the video which was great uh, we do it quite regularly if I've got time. There was a lot of guys on there saying to me, Cam Smith's going to be the, the shock this week. You know, Cam Smith, he is playing some dog-awful golf. So, yeah, St. Andrews, feedback, get that. We you know we just mentioned that. Get all of it. <clears throat> but sometimes, of course, especially with DraftKings, you're looking for players that have got... They're not playing well right now, but you stack it all up. You're going to get low percentage ownership on a player that you know is just going to spring into life. Mm. Cam Smith is playing so badly. I think he tied with Anthony Kim last week at LIV down in Houston. Yeah, yeah. Now that takes a hell of a turnaround to then go and contend, if not win, a US Open the week after. Mm. So Cam Smith for me. I mean, I'm seeing him as short as 28 to 1 with Paddy Power. Paul, I wouldn't put a penny of your money on that. No. No, I get that. I would respond. much prefer Matt Fitzpatrick or Tommy Fleetwood, who are either side of him in the betting. Mm-hmm. Don't get Cam Smith. We'll see them. Right, okay. Let's crack on then. Um, Paul, you're going to go through your uh, triple digits towards the end of this segment. I will start at completely the other end. I've got no remorse. I've got no apology about it at all. Um, I have taken mm, just under, a, just over a third of my stake this week, and I've just banged it straight on Scotty Scheffler. Um, thankfully, <clears throat> I managed to get four to one with Star Sports Monday morning. Fantastic! I'll have that. I think Scotty Scheffler wins the U.S. Open this week. I think agronomy. Geography, conditions, atmospherics. I just think everything about this golf course is perfect for Scotty Scheffler. And last week, he wins his first tournament outside of the southeastern or southern United States at in Ohio. So that we've, we've ticked that one off the list as well. So the game does travel. So, yeah, Scotty Scheffler, 4 to 1, 6 points. Mm. I've been saying that for weeks. Yeah. Interestingly enough, I'm going to quote these, Paul, because I did say at the top of the show, you do these fantastic um, US Open, oh, sorry, major championship averages, 
which do continually move. So the numbers I'm quoting go back to the Masters in 2018. Scotty Scheffler's average round score across 17 majors is 69.81. He's actually being beaten by Ben Coles, who finished 26 at the PGA Championship. He's had one major. He's at 68.75. But clearly, 69.81 Scheffler. We then jump to 70.28 for McElroy. 70.29 for Brooks. 70.33 for Xander. 70.42 70.42 for Colin Morikawa, 70.46 for John Rahm. Those are your top six major performers over the last, uh, what'd that be, six years? Yep, yeah, back to the start of 2018, as you say. Interesting enough, next up on the rank, Ludwig Oberg at 70 and a half. He's only played in two. That's a, that's a second and a missed cut. And Victor Hovland at 70.58. Some likely names then. Yeah. So I'm on Scheffler. Next up up for me, I don't think you'll be anywhere. You two will be around these price points, so I might as well crack on. I said it at the top of the show, Morikawa reminds me of Xander. Now, ordinarily, when I look at the, the research that I do... I think you do, ideally at a US Open, you need to be an extremely long hitter. Um, Colin isn't that. But the one number that does grab me with Colin Morikara, even though he's your 288, 290 man off the tee, although when I was watching the early coverage from um, Muirfield Village last week, I saw one of his drives went 340, which I was like, whoa. Colin was 340. He hit it way past Scotty on that particular hole. Which does show you there's something there when he actually catches one. Mm. Um, but he just doesn't tend to be that aggressive. Because all he wants to do is hit fairways. Number one on the PGA Tour for fairways hit. For me, he's a bit of a modern day Jim Furyk. But he's got more pop than Jim ever had. Um, I just think this, this course, is, well, again, will be very, very positive for Colin. The number that grabs me when you look at all of them, despite him not being the longest, he's 15th on the PGA Tour for strokes gained off the tee. Now, Martin Keimer arriving here was 10th for strokes gained off the tee in 2014, despite not really being the longest off the tee. So I think Morikawa is quite close to Keimer in, in shot shape and in game shape, so... Yeah, I'm on Morikawa. I managed to schnitch a 16 to 1 on Morikawa with bottle sports eight places each way. That's nice. Yeah, they just lengthened the price as I was actually putting my, uh, Paul's putting my preview out, which doesn't ever happen. <laughs> so uh, thank you to ball sports. They took it down within an hour, but hmm, overly, not worried. Yeah. Right, so I'm stopping there at 16 to 1. Where are you guys at with your first bet? Barry, I'll come to you. It's, I'm, I'm kind of, I haven't put any bets on yet, and I'm kind of struggling to figure out the angle. Do I look for markets without Scheffler, because, or do I just back him and make it a really boring week and having one horse? So I'm I'm kind of lost a little bit at the moment. I have a few names I have. So I have a Max Homa bet anti-post from last year. I don't even want to look at his odds now because I know they'll probably be better than the anti-post mm, odds were. Similar. Okay, that's fine. Uh, small relief. Um, I've Hovland uh, noted down for a few weeks, um, kind of in, in the Keimer vibe with the short game that not an elite short game and could happily just choose putter. But now we've got a little bit of chaos in there um, with the slightly, with, with the change in the size of the greens, but he can chip as well. So playing well, might go on him. Um, I have a note about Tigala because he led the field putting at the players. Um, and we have, you know, established a link to the players here. Uh, and I also threw down um, after he won Bob McIntyre. 
Mm. I'll be, I think I think I'm going to put an each way bet on McIntyre. Don't care about mm. the with without Scheffler market. I I just think that mentally that'll be a new level unlocked. I do I see him winning? Probably like, not really. No, he really will be pinging the odds if he does win. But I, th- I think there's a good chance he could just ride the uh, the wave he's on and grab a place. Yeah. 12 of the last 15 US Open winners, first-time major winners. Yeah, does happen. And you mentioned a couple of names there, Barry. Haven't won a major. Mm. It's not a bad course of action. What about you, Paul? Yeah, I've got one that's relatively short, a shared with you, but I, I, can, I can start off and then uh, you can... You can, oh, finish, you can finish, as it were. Um, and then then I've got one mid-price and then the three longers that uh, you alluded to earlier. But the short, shorter one um, is Brooks Koepka. Um, first player I back this week. Um, I know you're on him as well. 20-1 to 1, um, with 10 places with Betfred. I took him in exactly the same terms as you, actually. Um, you can get slightly longer out there, but I think with 10 places at 20-1, to 1, that's a cracking each way bet. And... With Brooks, you've undoubtedly got the sort of player who could, not necessarily will, but could stare, stare down uh, Scotty Scheffler. As we know, twice a US Open champion, three times a PGA champion. He peaks for these major champions, um, a major monster, as I think you described him. Um, we focused a little bit after the, the Masters, didn't he? He was poor at the Masters, 45th. Yep. Rubbish. knew he, he kind of knew things weren't right didn't he 26th at the US PGA um, and that was coming off the back of a win at uh, Live Singapore wasn't it that's right I was on him at 14 to 1 at the PGA mm. <clears throat> yeah and I, I think having that win we talked about it in the pre-pod didn't we where many mm-hmm. of the players have either a win or a second place or you know a very close finish in the calendar year to date so having that win in the locker is good for, for Brooks's chances, I think. Fourth year back in 2014. Bear in mind, back in 2014, that was a young Brooks Kepka. He was uh, he was only playing mm. his fourth major championship. Yeah. And uh, I think he was still playing. He's kind of flitting between Europe and America back then. He'd, uh, he'd graduated mm-hmm. from the Challenge Tour the, the year before, but I think he was still... Um, he still wasn't kind of cemented on the PGA Tour back then. So it kind of gives you a, a feel as to where he was in his career. So for him to come and finish fourth, which was a, a big personal best at the time in a major championship, um, that was big for Brooks. But it was last week. He played in Houston last week. Um, ninth overall, some cracking numbers. And I'm sure these are exactly the same numbers that you plucked out and thought, well, um, Brooks has got to go in. Because second for driving accuracy... Um, third for total driving, second for ball striking on the basic numbers that come out of the live tour. Yeah. That was absolutely spot on. Looks like the perfect platform for me <laughs> for uh, for Brooks to build on. So, so yeah, Brooks, 20 to 1, 10 places. I'm absolutely happy to have that. Five-time major winner. His major form this year reads 45, and he said himself he was undercooked, didn't prepare. Mm. I don't know, maybe he sat in his garden staring out at the uh, at the boat bobbing up and down at the bottom too much, um, having you know having some tequila or whatever. Twenty um, sixth at the PGA. Now that PGA Championship, when I was writing that tip, if I'd have known what that played like, I wouldn't have put Brooks Kepper up. A, a major that's won at twenty one under on a soft golf course, where yeah. penalty off the tee is negated, and where you don't have to aim for the middle of the greens, you can just aim for pins all week. That is not Brooks Kepka. This is Brooks Kepka. Mm-hmm. You know, with him and Ricky Elliott, I, we've said this, Barry, and we've mentioned this, you know, you can say this about Scotty and his relationships with the caddy. This is a strategist golf course. And you've got to have a strategy that you say, on oh, Thursday morning, this is what we're going to do. <clears throat> and very little is going to change until we literally get to the back nine and I might need to do something to position myself in a, in a better way to get up the leaderboard a little bit closer. But you've literally got to have a strategy each and every day and you stick to it. And I think Pinehurst, I'm hoping, is that course. His live form, by the way, is 919. It's not exactly disastrous, is it? <laughs> 919. 
This was the number that grabbed me from last week. Now, Rick Gaiman has got a deal with Liv. I was talking to Rick on uh, X last night, and I said, where are you getting these strokes going data from, from Liv? And he's, he's, he was very honest about it. He said, I've brokered a data deal, so I get a data, field out of, a data feed out of Liv. So fair play. The number that grabbed me that I saw on Rick, and follow Rick Gaiman, fantastic, the videos he's done on YouTube, really, really good. The number that I grabbed for Brooks last week at Houston, he gained with the driver... Listen to this. Across three rounds in total, 6.87 strokes off the tee. Now, just to give that some kind of clarity, Akshay Bhatia at the Memorial was the best driver of the golf ball last week. He gained 4.11 strokes gained off the tee in 72 holes. Mm. Brooks gained 6.87 across 54. Impressive. That's he also shot a Sunday. It was almost as if Sunday, right, guys? Let's literally, and we love this before majors, don't we? Come on, guys. Let's see what's under the pedal, pedal, Ricky. Okay, come on, let's go for it. Seven under sixty-five, best score on Sunday at Live Houston. Mm -hmm. I think he's totally under the radar. I genuinely think. I was on Andy Lack's podcast last week. Andy and I, we always do a, a on the Inside Golf podcast, we'll do a, a pre-major research podcast. And he was running through his runners and riders. And the second person he mentioned was Brooks Kepka. And I literally sat there while we were recording going, God, I don't really know why you're going Bro near Brooks, Andy. And I said to him, you, you know me, Andy, I don't need any excuses to back Brooks Kepka a major. I said, what I need, though, I need some very strong pointers in Houston that the game is there. And, Paul, you've gone through some great pointers. He's driving the ball phenomenally well right now. And I mm -hmm. genuinely think with the approach play, I think he was top 10 for greens in reg as well. I think with a firmer, faster, harder Pinehurst number two, you will see Brooks Kepka towards the top of the leaderboard. And I would love to see, I keep saying this, I want to see a major where Scotty and Brooks and a number of the big names are all fighting it out. Yep. Could be because the then we start getting to the fact, this doesn't become strokes gained anymore. This is who's got the biggest set of kahunas. Mm. That's major golf at its very peak. That's what I want to say. Yep. Agreed. <clears throat> Now, I've got one more, and it follows on from Barry here, actually. Now, just to get it out there, and this is just through my research, when you look at Michael Campbell and you look at Martin Keimer, on their outing previous to winning here at Pinehurst, they were in the top 10 for driving accuracy and had extremely good um, total driving numbers. Bear in mind, we're going back to years where strokes game weren't really available, Okay. So get that again, top 10 driving accuracy, the out in before they won at Pinehurst. So I've been very, very particular this time. I'm just looking at my memorial numbers. Um, Colin Morikawa was eighth for driving accuracy. So I stuck with him. Brooks Kepka led driving accuracy in Houston last week. 81% of fairways hit. Sergio Garcia was second, by the way. Now, this might actually give hope to non Scotty Scheffler backers because he was quite, when I say wayward, he was first for greens in reg. He only hit, he was 24th for driving accuracy. So anyway, anyway I'm with Scotty because he's 10th for driving accuracy across the whole year. Right. The name that dragged, really grabbed me last week, hasn't won a major, hasn't really come close to winning a major. But as we know, in golf betting in 2024, this area from 25 to 1 and now 22, 25s, right out to 50 to 1, it's dead in terms of winners. Dead, 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 dead. No one's winning. So I wanted someone 50 to 1 plus. The numbers that grabbed me last week were from Sahid Tagala. Shock horror. I know. He was 8th for driving accuracy at Memorial. He was 12th for driving distance. He was 5th for greens in regulation. 1st for total driving. He was 2nd uh, for ball striking. You'll like this one, Paul. 4th for all round. Go and listen to the uh, research podcast. Mm. From a strokes going off the tee perspective, 2nd. 
<clears throat> I've been on Sir Heath the last two years at Harbour Town, where he's finished fifth and second. Loves Carolina type golf courses. He's also got a top seven at Copperhead. Yes, I know it's in Florida, but again, it's a it's basically a Carolina golf course. I just think Sir Heath, who went out in the second from last group at the PGA last major on Sunday, I just think he's a little bit under the radar. And I grabbed, I think was it fifty five to one, Paul? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I know with Sir Heath, he could be nine over through the first three holes. Get that. But I don't know. On a golf course where his weakness around the green could be negated because he can be taking putter, uh, you know, a la Texas Wedge, a la Martin Keimer, Sir Heath, with the driver and with the approach play and with the putter, as Barry said, did you say stroke uh, number one for putting at the players this year? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think Sir Heath Tagal is a bad bet at 55 to 1. That's me. I'm done. Those are my four. Very good. I've got another one slightly longer than that, and then I'll I'll take you through my um my three triple digit picks. And the one I've backed uh, kind of mid price is Keegan Bradley, seventy to one with ten places. That's with Labrooks. Um, I mentioned Bradley in uh, the pre pod last week, and. That was largely off the back of his first for total driving, fourth for all round at the US PGA Championship, first for total driving, second for all round at Colonial. And uh, kind of, you know, having preached about those two basic, yeah, and I, I, I get the flaws in those stats, but those two basic stats, which pop up time and again in the analysis for this particular tournament, mm. um, if I'd have preached about those and then not backed Keegan Bradley. Yeah. And then gone back and reviewed the numbers again and see these two numbers or four numbers staring me in the face, then, um, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't, couldn't, it would, would not sit comfortably with me. So, so I'm there with Keegan. Um, he's also won on a Donald Ross course, uh, back at the 2018 BMW Championship. That was at Aronimink. Um, and you remember he won his PGA Championship major at Atlanta Athletic Club, which was on, Champ and Bermuda Greens as well. So yeah. there's a couple of a couple of bits of correlation there. Um, yeah. And to top it off, he was fourth here at Pinehurst back in 2014. Played really well. So a bit of course form to boot as well. Playing some really nice stuff, Keegan Bradley. I know you've mentioned that fact over the last few weeks. And um, 70 to 1 with the extended places. I think Keegan could sneak into... The, uh, the paying each way places. Potentially one to look out for in the first round leader market So I will see what he gets in terms of a uh, a tea time later today. Um, my first round, pre- first round leader preview will be out on Wednesday morning UK time. For me, Keegan is the sort that comes to tournaments like a, like a Brooks Kepka, but clearly not that level. Tough of the tournament, Keegan Bradley comes to the full. Hmm. Love yeah. him at the same price area. Love Tom Kim. Just couldn't get to him with my staking plan. I'm seeing 66 to 1 out there about Tom Kim. Mm. Yeah, yeah. A winner on a Donald Ross golf course. I know you can't translate Sedgefield to here, but he's good on the green surfaces. He likes Bermuda. He was just the putting let him down last week. The, the putting went backwards, but the approach play, the driving was excellent. So I like Tom Kim. I think there's quite a few to like around these prices. Sepp's playing some great golf, isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if Barry's. Uh... I don't. I don't mind Robert. Yeah, Robert McIntyre either. I think he, he's a decent bet around yeah. here. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Barry ends up on the with a little bit of Sepp in the uh, more in the more plan. than likely. <clears throat> there's a good chance he's playing some really good golf. I'm just uh, he I, is. I, I, I'll be very. Yeah, just assume I'm going to back Sepp. He's the driving. <laughs> yeah. He's hitting it long and so dead straight. You know, he's he's yeah. dominating off the tee. You know, he's top yeah. five across a lot of tournaments recently off the tee. Yeah. Really, the, I really keep, impressive. I, I am keeping, like, the the driving accuracy is one thing I'm, I'm looking at um, for sure this week. Absolute raw length 
is not something I'm going to lean on too heavily because a lot of these fairways pinch in around the 300 yard mark. Yeah. So if 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 you're trusting your shot shape and want to take it on, yeah, you can get the ball. Yeah, you, know, you can really get some short clubs in your hand. But you are adding, you're taking on a bit more risk at that point by threading it through those uh, narrower mm-hmm. necks at 300. So I guess it's, it's you know, when, when do you want to take on the risk um, this week? Do you want to be conservative off the tee and then you've got a stronger second shot, uh, or sorry, a harder second approach shot in? Or do you want to take the risk off the tee of being in trouble, but you could give yourself a wedge in or a very, you know, a sh- very short wedge in? So that's just something I'm trying to keep in my mind about the, the way the course is set up and, and versus length. Look, length is always an advantage. So, um, but yeah, those are my thoughts there. Mm. These yeah. fairways are extremely wide. Let's get that out there. They, they're, they're runway strip wide, but you are, mm. as Webb Simpson said, you are, and he's a pretty straight driver. You're going to end up in the in these. You just want a minute. You don't want to be ending up in these sandy native areas 25 times against people that are ending up in them 17 times because you're going to get. You just literally, there's going to be you know one in three chance or whatever the number is that you are going to literally be in a. You can't. You just have to chip out sideways. Mm-hmm. The most inaccurate drivers of the big names last week at Memorial were Justin Thomas, Alex Noren, JT Poston, Cam Young, Victor Perez, Taylor Pendrith, Denny McCarthy, uh, Will Zalatoris, I'm going down by the way, uh, Tony Finau, the worst of the lot, Ben Arn, worst of those that made the cut. Mm. I'm seeing him being backed this morning, Ben Arn. <clears throat> you just got to pray that he ain't going to be behind the cabbage and the uh, the wire grass and whatever there, whatever herbal things that you're getting in these sand areas, because he's going to find them a lot more than other golfers by the looks of it. Yeah. Well, your longer shots, Paul. Where are you at? Yeah, there's as, as you said, there's a um, there's a preview on the website. So if you want to um, get a little bit more detail about my three triple digit prices then uh, pop along and have a read of that but I'll, I'll run you through the basics um Akshay Batia I've backed 150 to 1 that was with bet 365 and their eight place option some cracking combinations of price and um, eight place uh, terms as standard from 365 this week so do check them out what's the bonus code Paul sport 30 sports 30 but bet 365 yeah absolutely um do uh, yeah you, you you can look at some of these bookies and the way that they approach these majors and uh, you got to say that 365 are particularly strong again this week so uh, well worth a look but yeah bat here um 150 to one Starting to learn how he operates now, aren't we? So last summer, um, had a poor run, then finished 35th at the John Deere, 9th at the Barbasol, won the Barracuda. Earlier this spring, 17th at the Valspar, 11th at Houston, and then he won in Texas. I was on board him that week. Um, he kind of seems the player that just builds up, um, finds a bit of form, and then can just go bang. So perhaps he's building again. Two missed cuts, 60th in Canada, 22nd last week at Memorial and one of the stats that you mentioned a few minutes ago Steve that caught my eye too first for strokes gain off the tee last week yeah amazing really he's a proper ball striker Bartia yeah yeah absolutely fifth for total driving as well that other metric which um, he's an elite ball striker mm. that's what we're coming to learn yeah 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 Yeah, I like that I like that I think think it fits quite nicely I think there's a big major personal best coming from uh, Batia this week. Victor Perez have also backed at 200 to 1. Again, that was with Bet365. Uh, we talked about some linksy style links in the pre-pod and we've touched on it again here. Actually, you picked up on some correlation with results on the old course at St Andrews as well, Steve, didn't you, during your mm-hmm. research? And I guess in a way, this is a bit like America's St Andrews, um, you know, with its heritage and uh, the, the way the you know, the history of the course or the course is sets yep. up. The whole resort, um, it just draws thousands to it every, every year to absolutely. go and play the Pinehurst courses. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's certainly some correlation, you know, of course, in, in the way the course is set up, not, not so much. But if you look at um, Michael Campbell, Martin Keimer, both of them have got form on the old course. 
Um, and so does Victor Perez, who's uh, won the Dunhill Links. Um, he won that back there in 2019. I, you know, it may be extremely tenuous, but I don't think it's a bad angle of um, investigation, really. Perez has also won the uh, KLM Open and the Abu Dhabi Championship. Both events won by Martin Keimer as well. Um, both on different courses, but so uh, you know, there's certainly some correlation between their respective careers. And he comes into this playing some really good golf. Third in Canada, 12th at Memorial last week. Strokes gained approach numbers um, over the last three starts. 10th, 9th, 7th. I think Perez could again find himself in the paying places this week at a good price. The final one, David Puig. Um, P-U-I-G if you're looking down the uh, betting list. How did you... <coughs> By the way, when I do listen to golf... Oh, sorry, when I watch Live, the guy calls him David Puig. 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 <laughs> How did I pronounce it? Puig. It's, da- there's no I Puig. in it at all when the, when that guy says, Puig. you know, the commentator that does... The, it, it's, it's David Puig. Puig. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. I I've, I've, I've not quite mastered his pronunciation yet. No, and I certainly haven't either. But um, yeah, David <laughs> Poog. Poog. Yeah, let's let's go with that. Um, three hundred to one with ball sports are back to match. Still available at that price right now. Um, he's one of these youngsters that the uh, the live tour snapped up. Um, he was still at Arizona State College at the time. Um, and uh, Jack that in to go and play on live. Um. Clearly, the, uh, the the lure of the uh, the, the money was um, sufficient to, to get him to take that career decision at the time. But it seems like a seems like a decent decision to have made. He's got a few top fives now at live level, including last week. He was third in Houston last week, second for total driving on that course. Um, so that caught the eye. Hits it an absolute mile and putts really well as well. He's topped the putting stats, the basic putting stats, and three of his last. 10 outings at all levels um, and I've been reading about his aspirations of making the Spanish Olympic team this year he needs the world ranking points of course he's not going to get those from playing on live so he's been popping along to a lot of these Asian tour events in between the live outings um, he won in Singapore on the Asian tour in October he won in Malaysia in February on the Asian tour and he's uh, gravitating up the world rankings this in terms of the OWGR points that are available, would be huge to him. So I guess if he's got, and he has got real aspirations of making that Spanish team, I think this will be a huge, huge target for him. And um, I think, you know, I, I think he's a big talent. I think he's the kind of player that we're going to see more and more of over the over the years. And like, uh, like Ludwig Oberg, we will all learn how to pronounce his name at some point when he continues to to be on our radar over the next few years. But uh, yeah, I think this uh, I think this could be the one. This could be the major where he really starts to make a name for himself and becomes more of a household name. So yeah, my three: Pug, Perez, and Akshay Batia. <laughs> and I, I, I usually. Um, brutalised Batir's pronunciation as well so perhaps I should have picked three easier ones to say Have you got anyone at triple digits Barry? Do I ever uh, I have a, I have one who has won twice in a row recently on the KFT Harry Higgs mm. Mm. and that just that guy is on a tear mm. Yes indeed so I'm looking for pro- just the merge of price and places. But I, I, I kind of want those 12 places. They're on offer, so let's figure that one out. And I think I've seen Carl at 250 to 112 places. Um, so he's three. Careful with more. Carl. They are sick, the odds. Oh, I'll have to change that then. Thank you for pointing that one out. Okay, so then I'm looking at Betfair. Okay, I'll find out. But generally, he's 300 to 1, eight places. Um, I'll, figure, I'll have to work that one out. Oh, there you go. Betfred, 300 to 110 places. That might be something around mm-hmm. what I'll do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then just a, like a mega, a mega, mega outsider um, in terms of odds, but Zach Blair. Mm-hmm. So I've figured out that I can get him at 600 to 112 places on Betfred. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. Beat that one, Paul. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've got anything down that uh, down that kind of level. There's some there's some huge huge prices about players this week in the thousands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it was, it's such an it's because it's literally an open. A lot of the players at the bottom end of this are particularly poor quality. So the spread in the spread in betting this week is amazing. Mm. There's some big old prices down there. Jim, I tell you one that I'm five hundred. Yeah, I tell you one I've got a sneaky feeling might do well here, and I, I could be completely wrong. Mackenzie Hughes, mm. he's playing well, isn't he? Yeah. If you want that kind of magic bean style, way you know, at the end of the day, he doesn't hit many greens, but then he doesn't hit many greens every week. <laughs> but what he does do is scramble and putt lights out. There's going to be one or two of those sorts that gets right in the mix this week, mm. at least for a top 10. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not saying to win, but, you know, third at Valspar, Copperhead, so that's a Carolina golf course this year. He was sixth at Quail Hollow, another Carolina golf course. I mean, you wouldn't really say that that place, you know, is is is, is uh, Mackenzie Hughes um, favourable. And he was seventh at the Canadian Open. He was literally going head to head for the win. So yeah, I think Mackenzie Hughes at anything up to two fifth, uh, anything up to two two five. With bet three six five isn't a bad bet this week. That's eight places each way. I hope your bets go well this week, chaps. Best of luck, guys. You too, boys. Best of luck to the listeners. We'll be back next week with the Travelers Championship. And what have you got, Paul? Uh, KLM Open over in Holland next week. We'll see you again soon. Cheers. If you like betting on golf, but everyone that you back misses the car. Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips And so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf